Hey guys, uh, we're going to get going in a minute here. I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. Can you just throw a hand up if, if you can hear my audio okay? Okay, hey guys, it is 1 p.m. Uh, we are going to get going. Uh, just again, just to double check, can everybody just throw a hand up if you can hear me okay? I just want to make sure everybody can can hear my audio. Awesome. Okay, cool. I'm seeing uh, a good amount of hands up. Okay, I'll give everybody one more minute. Okay, awesome. I see a, 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 a lot of hands up. Um, so my name is John Anastasides. Uh, welcome to the third installment of the Locked in Learning series. Today we are going to be discussing Visilogic, Visilogic data logging. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys some methods and how we can interact with the software when we're troubleshooting and throughout the logging process. Okay, so um, still no update on hockey, unfortunately, but this series is definitely gonna continue. Again, like I said, this is the third installment. So far, we've discovered hardware and software and also ladder and HMI. If anybody has missed those or just wanna take a look back at uh, the recordings, we do have those up on uh, uh, a website we can send you a link for if you haven't already seen that. This week, we are discussing data logging. Uh, Tuesday was the Unistream portion. Zach, great job on that. That was very informative. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the vision package. And next week, we are going to be taking a look at communication. So those of you guys who are curious about some of the, the different protocols and, and means of uh, communicating with different third-party devices and also Unitronics devices, uh, that's going to be a good one for you guys Tuesday and Thursday of next week. Okay, so data logging. Uh, I guess one of the first questions is, is why, right? So you have the ability with these controllers to track information and also record it. Um, think of any sort of process that you might have uh, in a given application. Let's just say you wanna keep track of temperature in a specific zone or pressure or level of a tank um, throughout the day or week. You have the ability to keep track of that data and there are a couple of different ways that you can do it. One of the uh, most, I guess, most rewarding uh, results that that data logging pr provides is the ability to go back and take a look at uh, a historical list of samples right so let's just say if you have uh, a zone where you think 
uh, the temperature might have exceeded a, a, a maximum for a certain amount of time. If you have that information logged, you can go back and, and take a look at that at, at any point and see what might have caused it, uh, if there were any events that day that might have been related to it, and so on. So um, it's a very nice feature when it comes to building a project, and it is not that difficult to implement, which is also awesome. Now, uh, another big reason why why data logging is extremely helpful and uh, is is very useful is is the troubleshooting process. Um, you have a number of different um, capabilities with the controller to see or track what uh, an issue might be, or if you have uh, a specific trend uh, that you're trying to avoid, you can actually uh, log this data and see what what the system is is actually doing currently now you have a number of different methods for when it comes to data logging right the first method being vector logging now um vector logging is it's it, it's very helpful when when troubleshooting typically when you have an actual application in runtime um, data tables trending and log files are going to be more useful to you uh, vector logging you actually can set aside a section of memory um, that you can store values to if you wanted to let's just say keep track of in FIFO style maybe the last um, 20 temperatures that were recorded or pressures that were recorded and it's very useful to the user to have all of that information in one um, section of memory or, or vector and we're actually going to do an example today where I'm going to show you how to create a group of operands or a vector. We're not gonna focus so much on vector logging today. Uh, what I wanna do is I wanna use this time to show you data tables and trending more specifically. Now what a data table is, uh, is think of a list of uh, historical points, if you will, that the user or the programmer can create. Typically you're gonna have a timestamp um, and that is gonna make uh, the, the point a little bit more tangible uh, and that's just because you'll you'll know exactly when that was logged. Give it, uh, for an example, let's just say if you had um, an application where you're recording temperatures, it makes much more sense to have a date and time associated with the point just so everything makes a little more sense when you go back and review the information. But you absolutely have the ability to build the table however you'd like. Uh, trending is going to give the user the ability to view a graphical trend on screen to see uh, what the system is currently doing and also scroll back and see what the system was doing previously. So a trend is a very nice feature um, when you have a uh, when, when you have users who might be interacting with the screen a good amount of time and want to see what is happening specifically. Now log files, um, log files are going to allow you to save information to the SD card that you can view at a later time. Uh, log files are very helpful, again, when you have issues or if you have um, a certain scenario that might have happened and you want to go back and take a look at, at why it may have happened. Uh, another nice um, feature when it comes to log files is the ability to open up the 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 log in excel and actually view it on a pc right so if you wanted to let's just say share that with a number of different users um you're going to have an actual file that is that is uh tangible and you're able to to open it up and, and view it in excel now means of displaying information or gathering information um, you'll see that when we do our trend example we have this information available to us right on the hmi and runtime uh, when we take a look at data tables, you actually have a separate online test mode that you have the ability to track what is being logged to the table. And again, you'll see some tools in the data table editor that's going to allow you to import and export to and from Excel. Um, you'll have the ability to overwrite the information in the table. You can clear the table. Uh, if you wanted to build recipes, you also have the ability to create a table uh, in the editor and write that information to the data table memory in the PLC as well. 
and then also your SD card. I'm not. Uh, it's 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 a little bit difficult to 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 show you specific um, features for the the SD card in one hour. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull up a pre-built example that I have, and I'm just going to walk you through some of the the options that you have. And again, if if at any point you guys have questions, uh, feel free to throw it in the question box. Uh, anything that I cannot either answer in this webinar or if you want to just take something more in depth let's just say if you have questions about uh, creating uh, a specific excel file for your project feel free to shoot us an email we'd be, we'd be happy to, to assist with that okay so the goals for today we're going to take a look at trends first um, what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you how to log values versus time I'm going to show you how to configure a trend and curve in the software and display it on the HMI. And I will show you how to go back and view the older portions of the trend while in runtime. We're then going to take a look at data tables. What we're going to do is we're going to build a table in the editor. I'll show you some of the properties that uh, in, in configurable items that you have available to you. Uh, we'll take a look at how to make a timestamp, and this is going to incorporate creating a group of operands just like you would for vector logging, and I'll show you how to view the history. And then for utilities, I'm going to open up an example project, and this is going to highlight how to save files to the SD card, how to create an Excel file, and then also just introduce some external utilities that you have uh, available for your application if you do not want to push to an SD card. Okay, so now we're going to jump into the fun stuff. Let's open up the software. Now what I have here is a blank project. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose my hardware configuration. I have a 570 on my desk here. I'm going to press OK. And again, the first part of uh, the, the webinar today, what I'm gonna do is I am going to show you how to build a trend on screen. Now, a trend is gonna allow you to track a certain value. Um, just due to time constraints, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna import a subroutine that I have built previously, and all that subroutine is going to do is just create a triangle wave that we are going to be able to trend on screen so the user can view it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate over to here to my main module under my solution tree. I'm going to choose import subroutines to module. So you do have the ability in projects, if you wanted to build a subroutine and export it and then import it into a new project, you absolutely have the ability to do that. I'm going to choose import subroutines. What I can do is I can go to my desktop here. I can grab my triangle wave. And you'll see that what happens is it brings it right into the module that I had right clicked on. I only have one module right now and it imports it as a subroutine. Now in our webinar series, I know that I've mentioned subroutines, but I don't think that we've actually gone through the process of creating one. Um, so what a subroutine is going to be is a separate portion of ladder logic outside of the main routine. Uh, and what subroutines do is, is in, especially in large projects, is they allow you to be able to almost tidy up the application. They're really used for um, organizational purposes in big projects, or if you want to only have a specific section of code run um, when the conditions are right uh, those are when subroutines are typically used now the trick with subroutines is you have to have a call from either the main routine or another running subroutine very important so this logic will not get triggered unless i have a call in the main routine uh, before i make that call what i want to do is i just want to run through what this is doing um, so what i have is a system bit that is creating a 100 millisecond pulse and what that is doing is either incrementing or decrementing based on if I have reached my limits. Now, I am capping this triangle wave in between a value of 0 and 100. So you'll see that when I reach 100, I'm counting down. And when I reach 0, I'm counting back up. So that is how I am 
generating this triangle wave. Uh, if you are, um, or if you have any questions or just wanna wanna play around with this routine, feel free to, to reach out after. Um, I'd be happy to send you this project or at least provide a link for it. Now, the subroutine itself, right, I have to make sure that I'm calling it from a running routine. Now, my main routine here uh, is the only other routine that I have. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to utilities, call, I'm gonna get a call subroutine block, I'm gonna place it right on the rail, and I'm gonna choose triangle wave. Now, the way that the controller is going to scan once I have a subroutine in the project is once it sees the subroutine call, and you'll see that I have it right here in net one, so it sees it in the first net, the scan sees the call, jumps into the triangle wave routine, processes the logic, jumps out, then moves on to net two, and processes the rest of the main routine. Once it gets to the end, it goes back up to net one, sees triangle wave, jumps in, processes triangle wave, jumps back out again. So it's very important to keep in mind that this triangle wave, since it is directly on the rail, it is going to be called every single scan of the controller. If I didn't want that to be the case, or if I wanted to be able to toggle that call on and off, what I can do is I can put a condition before it, and that's gonna allow me to be able to control when the subroutine is, is called or not. Now, just to give you an idea, again, MI1 is my triangle wave value. So MI1 is going to be the value that I am going to have set for my curve on the screen. Now, to build a trend in the solution tree, you'll see that I have a number of trends available to me, right? I have eight trends with my V570. Now, each of these trends can have eight separate curves on them. So you have in total 64 curves available for this 570 project. In order to configure trend one, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click and choose properties. I'm gonna change the name just to something generic like test trend. I then have the ability to create what I want to set as the sampling interval. That is gonna be how frequently I update this trend. So I'm gonna make this a one second update rate. My next parameter is the number of history samples. When we have the trend on screen, I'm gonna have the ability to go back and take a look at a number of previous points. These are the number of samples that I'm gonna be able to look at. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'll just make this a generic number like 10,000. I then need a run stop memory bit. What this is gonna do is activate the trend. So I need to have a bit here and in a normal application, you might have conditions where you don't always want the trend to be running. Let's just say if you want the user to be able to go up and just dictate when the trend is running or not. Um, I would have conditions throughout the project that would allow me to de determine if that bit is on or on, uh, on or off or not. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to add a memory bit here. This is gonna be my run stop bit for trend and I am going to give this a power up value of set. So the second that the controller turns on, I already have my triangle wave routine running. So I'm gonna trend that curve from the second that, or the instance that the, that the controller powers on. So I'm gonna hit okay here. Now I also have the ability to link a trend description. Uh, the trend description is not uh, it's not mandatory. Uh, it is necessary if you wanted to have a description in a memory level. Let's just say if you wanted to have a string for the trend description that you maybe want to write eventually to a table, um, that is when you would have the trend description included here. For our example, we're okay not having it, so I'm just going to okay out here. So now I have my first trend configured. Once I have my trend configured, I can double click and I can configure any one of my eight curves. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna configure curve one, I'm gonna right click, I'm gonna choose the properties for curve one. And the first thing I'm gonna do, just so I know, I'm gonna change the name. So I know that this curve is my triangle wave value or triangle wave, we'll have it triangle wave val. Now, for the operand, 
I must link an MI that is going to provide the value for this curve when the trend is running. I'm gonna have MI1 as my triangle wave value. I'm then gonna set up my Y min and my Y max for my Y scale. The X axis is gonna be time. My Y scale is gonna be whatever that value is. Now I'm capping my curve in between zero and 100. So the default values are perfect. If I was building, let's just say a triangle wave that was zero to 150, I could change my Y max to 150. If I had a pressure that was, that was being tracked, I could have it be zero to 50 PSI. Whatever the application is, you're gonna set up your Y scale accordingly. And you'll see that you also can have decimal format associated as well. So I'm gonna hit okay. And now I have my trend properties configured. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my display. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my graphical elements in my vertical toolbar. And under graph, I have what looks like a trend element. If I hover over, you'll see that it is indeed trend. I'm gonna take it and I am going to click and drag and size it accordingly on screen. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to be weary of what happens until I am at a, an appropriate size. You'll see that I will not be able to create this trend or validly drop it on screen until I get to a certain size. You'll see that the minimum size is 200 by 140 pixels. And the reason why is you have a number of um, elements that are built into the actual trend widget that you need to account for when you are sizing, right? And I'll show you some of those, uh, what those buttons do once we have this project downloaded. Now we have already configured the curve property, right? We already know that that curve one is gonna be our triangle wave value, but we have a number of elements here that we have to uh, account for. The first one that we, that we have to make sure that we link before the okay button is enabled is we have to configure here, you'll see a current curve link. So we need an MI, so MI zero. And what this is, is our current curve shown. And what I mean by that is since you can have eight curves on the trend, the user has the ability to just touch the trend element once the project is downloaded, the trend widget on screen, and it's gonna cycle through any curves that are currently configured. I only have one curve configured, so the value in MI0 is always going to be one. Let's just say if I have my triangle wave, a pressure, and a temperature, I now have three potential curves to bring to the front. Right, so as I cycle through those, that number is just the index number of the current curve that is shown. A lot of people think that this link here is the actual curve um, that is linked to the trend. Um, what it actually is, is just what the current curve selected is, or current cur curve shown is. Now you'll also see that I have some cosmetic properties, but the most important is the curves tab right so i have the ability to change the color of the curve to whatever i'd like if i had multiple curves i could color code them specifically and i also have the ability to tie a bit to hide the curve so in a given trend depending on how many curves you have you're going to see all those curves at the same time if that is not uh, what is aesthetically pleasing for the project on hand, you have the ability to hide the curves depending on that hide bit, right? So the state of that bit determines if the actual curve is showing on the screen or not. So I can go ahead and hit OK. And I now have my triangle curve on the trend that is going to be shown on screen. So before I download this project, uh, I am going to jump in and set up a data table example, and then I'll do one download, and I'm gonna show you guys how everything interacts once it's downloaded. At this point, if anybody has any trend questions, go ahead and type those in in the question box, and we'll get to them at the end. 
So now in order to create a data table in a project, I actually have a specific portion of the software called the data table editor under my view menu. You'll see view data tables, and this is gonna pull up an internal menu that is gonna allow me to configure my table. So if I come over to here and hover over this button on the left, I have the ability to add a new table. If I click this button, I can give this table a name, we'll call it test table. I then have the ability to size it. Now it's important to note that you have the ability to make a table that is 32 by 32,767. So 32 columns is the max number of columns you can have in a table. You'll see if I try to enter 33, I must enter between one and 32. That's okay, I'm only gonna have two. I'm gonna have a timestamp and I'm also going to have the value that the triangle curve was at whenever I trigger my table write command. So what I'm gonna do for this table is I'm gonna have a timestamp and whatever that triangle curve uh, value is. So all I really need is two columns and any number of rows that I choose. If I only cared about uh, maybe the last 10 values, I could have 10 rows. We're just gonna use something a little bit more generic. We're gonna use a thousand. And that's going to allow me to track a uh, or record a large number of data for this table. And I'm going to show you exactly what it looks like uh, once it is downloaded. So I'm going to hit OK. And now that I have my table structure created, you'll see the name of the table right here. If I had more tables configured, they'd all be listed here. And I could just cycle through them to change their uh, properties. I have two columns. My first column is going to be my timestamp. Now I'm gonna create the timestamp in logic. So everything is gonna make a little bit more sense once we actually convert our real-time clock of the controller into ASCII format. But what we have to do when we are creating our table is determine what the column structure actually is. So column zero, this is actually gonna be our timestamp. And I'm converting the real-time clock that is always running in the controller to a string type so that we can write the string to the table. So you'll see in my type, if I have, or if I click my drop down menu here, I have string available. Now, part of project and read only. If I did not, if I do not want a user to overwrite this timestamp, right? Let's just say I wanted to make it not writable. What I can do is I can choose read only. And now I'm only going to be able to pull the information out of the table. So this is good for recipes. If I don't want any of my recipes to get changed, a read-only checkbox um, would would be would make sense here, right? We actually want to write information to the table. So I'm going to uncheck this. What part of project does? You only have a certain amount of memory set aside for internal data tables, unless you're writing externally. Um, to an SD card and at that point you have between 4 and 32 gigabytes of information. Part of project allows you to save on memory but you'll see that it also blurs out the read-only option. So again we don't care we have plenty of memory we want to absolutely be able to write this information to this table. The last thing we have to configure is the string length. Now I'm going to show you how to determine what the string length is. I'm gonna leave it as the default of 10 because it is, it is okay, it's kosher for this example, so I'm gonna hit okay. And what we're gonna do next is we're gonna configure our column that is going to house our triangle wave value. So I'm gonna change this column name to triangle wave value. It is gonna be an integer type now, when you have integer type selected, you'll see that you can set a min and a max, just like last week when we put an ele a numeric element on screen, we had the ability to cap it so that it could not have values outside of the range. Uh, we're only gonna see values between one and 100. Um, so this doesn't really make too much sense uh, for us in this, but if you wanted to cap it, you absolutely have the ability to set the min and max. You can change the format view to either decimal or hexadecimal. We're gonna leave it as decimal. And then I can select the number of elements that I'm gonna write. If I was writing an array 
of numeric elements, what I can do is I can in increase this number to two, and you'll see that I have descriptions available depending on which one. I only have one triangle wave value, so I'm gonna leave the number of elements as one, and I'm gonna okay out. Okay, so now I have my, my, tape, my test table configured, right? I have column one for my timestamp, column two for my triangle wave value, and you'll see if I scroll down here, I have all of my 1,000 rows, row zero to 999. Now I have to save this table, so I'm gonna hit okay. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build the logic that is going to allow me to write information to this data table. So again, you see the call for a triangle wave. If I am logging that triangle wave value along with a timestamp, I need a logical net to do this. So what I'll do is I'll add a comment for net2 just to let myself know if I go to open up this project in the future what this net is doing. So if I insert a comment in net2, every one second, log triangle wave value with a timestamp to test table. Now it's important to note that commenting is very um, useful, in a, especially in a large project or if you have very intricate code or an intricate process taking place. When you download this logic, if you were to upload it again, all the comments are gonna come with it. So it's very important to uh, make sure that in a big project, especially if you might have multiple programmers looking at it at some point, uh, comments go a very long way. What I'm gonna do next is I'm going to build my logic that every one second will write my information to the test table. So what I can do is I can grab a positive transition contact. And if you guys remember from last week, there was a system bit that generates a one second pulse that I can use in place of a timer. So if I wanted to write my information to the table, let's just say every five seconds or every 10 seconds, I can build some sort of resetting, self-resetting timer that is going to uh, run on its own and log the information as it runs. Um, the, the system bits allow you to almost bypass a timer and save it, especially in a big project. Using your system bits wisely uh, is very helpful. Um, you'll see that SB7 was the 100 millisecond pulse that I used in the triangle wave routine. I am going to take the positive transition of the one second pulse and use that to write my information to the table. So I'll hit OK. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create my timestamp. So if you remember, I had a string length of 10, that's 10 characters that is going to be uh, viable for that column. Anything more than 10 characters is gonna get truncated. So if I go to my string tools and I hover over RTC to ASCII, what this function block is gonna do is take the real time clock of the controller and it's gonna convert it to a string type. Now let's just be sure that my time is correct for my controller. What I can do is I can go to connection. And if I go to communication and OS, I'm gonna first check connection to my PLC. I am connected over ethernet. Again, this to a lot of people might look like magic. We are going to go into ethernet way more in depth in communications next week. If you just trust me, my IP address of my PC is 10.2.2.30 and the IP address of my controller is 10.2.2.90, so they are on the same network. And my PLC name is 147.182.08. If I hit OK and get my OPLC information, you'll see that it gets returned. This tells me that I have a current connection to my controller. Now, if I wanna make sure that my RTC of the controller is correct, again, I can go into info mode and I can manually change it. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot show you info mode on remote access, so just to be sure that we are setting up our RTC accordingly, you'll see that this is my PC's RTC. 
And if I click set RTC, it just takes the values from my PC. So now that I know my RTC is current, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to strings, I'm gonna get an RTC to ASCII function block, I'm gonna place it right in series with this positive transition. So you see that since it is on the power rail, every one second, it's going to pulse this full net. And what this net is gonna do is create the timestamp, write the timestamp and the triangle wave value to the table, and then it's gonna increment the row index number so that on my next write, it does not overwrite any of the previous information that I've stored to the table. So that's very important. Now, there are a couple of different styles of table that you can implement. Um, you have FIFO, you have LIFO, you have indexed, you can create recipes, you can overwrite recipes. The way that you create the effect is through logic. So for this table, all we're gonna do is just gonna, every one second, we're gonna take the timestamp and the triangle wave value and just write it to the table bump down to the next row, do the same thing in the next second, bump down to the next row, and so on. So I'm gonna drop this RTC to ASCII function block. Now you'll see, I have the ability to choose the time and date stamp accordingly. What I wanna do is I wanna show hours, hours, minutes, minutes, and seconds, seconds. Now you'll see in this uh, menu here, it tells me that this time, is going to require eight characters and a null, which in total is nine bytes, which equals five MIs. You have uh, an MI linked here, which is a 16-bit integer. A 16 or, or a one MI can hold two characters, right? So that's where that math is coming from that gives you five MIs. Um, so what's nice about this menu is you actually have the ability to see exactly how much memory you would need to use in order to show the time and date in a way that you would like. So if I want to show hours, hours, minutes, minutes, seconds, seconds, what I need is a group of five MIs. So if I hit OK here, right, I just chose the format for the time that I'm going to create. Now what I have to do is I have to choose a uh, section of memory that that uh, converted time is gonna get stored to. So I'm gonna jump down to MI10 and I'm gonna store this information in the next five MIs starting at MI10. Now in order to create a group, you'll see that once I choose uh, a, a, an MI address, the icon right below the number shows as enabled. If I hover over it, this allows me to set features for a group of operands. This is exactly how you create a vector if you wanna do vector logging. Since we're converting the time to a string, we're gonna do the same process. I'm gonna click this button and you'll see that a secondary menu pops up. The first thing that we have to do is determine the number of operands that are part of this group. I, I know that from the function block, it told me that I needed five MIs, so I'm gonna have five here. And for my description, this is gonna be my timestamp, and then you can use this number to sequentially number each of the MIs as uh, in this group. So if I choose this here, and then do forward slash five, this is going to name MI10, timestamp one of five, MI 11, two of five, and so on. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like in a second, but if I hit okay here, you'll see that that description populates in my uh, operand address box. Now, again, if I drop down, you'll see that everything is numbered sequentially. So the first portion of the string, the first two characters are in MI 10, the second two are in MI 11, and so on. Now, when you're building a string, you have to allot room for the null character. The null character determines the end of the string. That is why it was eight total characters for um, the actual characters for the time, and then the null is the ninth. Now, you have to bump up one more to account for the null, so that's why there's five MIs in use. 
uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on strings. If anybody has any more in-depth questions, uh, feel free to throw it in the question box or you can shoot us an email. I'd be happy to, to, to go over strings at any point. All right, so this is going to house my timestamp. Now the next portion of this net is going to be my actual act of writing the data to the table. So what I want to do is every one second fill in a row of data for each of my columns, right? So my timestamp, my triangle wave value, I'm going to bump down to the next row. And on the next second, I'm going to write a timestamp and a triangle wave value and so on. In order to do this, I'm going to go to my data tables drop down menu and you'll see a wide number of options that you have here. Everything from reading and writing to clearing the table to finding an element in the table. Uh, you can copy rows, you can copy column. What we're worried about right now is the data table's right row. This is going to allow us to take information and populate it inside of the table. So I'm going to place this right in series in net two. And it's a little bit different of a menu than what we've seen before, right? And the reason for that is based on the table that we choose, the column properties or the column structure might be different. So I first have to choose my table. And you'll see once I choose test table, very familiar, my timestamp and triangle wave value columns appear. And all I have to do is link my source operand, so where that information is coming from. My timestamp, I created to be located, or I generated it and stored it to MI10. And you'll see that in that string property, those are 10 characters, right? So I have eight characters plus the null. That all fits within that max of 10 characters, so we're going to be good to go. My triangle wave comes from MI1. So I have my timestamp coming from MI10, my triangle wave value coming from MI1. And the next thing I need to do, you'll see OK is still not enabled here. I need to determine what row I'm writing to in that particular instance. So what I can do is I can link my next usable MI, and I'm going to call this my row index. And I'm going to start at row zero. And I'm going to press OK. And you'll see that now MI2 is going to hold the row that I want to write to. By giving it a power up value of zero, the very first write on the very first second that that net is triggered, I'm going to start writing at row zero, which is the first row of our table. Now what I need to do to ensure that I don't overwrite any information is I need to make sure I'm jumping down to the next row on my next write. So I'm going to press OK and I need something, some sort of logical statement that is going to increase uh, my row index number. I know a lot of you guys are yelling at me through your PC. We need to use an incrementer and that's what we're going to do. And what I want to do is I want to increment that row index by one every time. So just to recap on what this net is doing, every time SB3, which is the internal bit that is generating a one second pulse for the controller, every time that that goes high, right, positive transition, if I used a negative transition, it would be every time that that bit went low. I'm taking my RTC in the format hours, hours, minutes, minutes, seconds, seconds, and I'm storing it to a string type. And the reason why I'm storing it to a string is because you'll see that I have characters incorporated as well, right? I have my colons in between the hours and minutes and then minutes and seconds. So that has to be a string type. I'm then writing that information to my test table that I've already created. And then I'm incrementing the row. So on the next time that this net gets generated, I don't overwrite the information that I've already filled in the table, right? What I had, what I have the ability to do is I could just write that information to the same row of the table every time, but that really doesn't do us any good. What I want to do is I want to see a history of all these points. Okay. So. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to download this project and I'm going to show you guys what is happening at runtime. 
So if I go to connection, again, I'm just going to double check my connection one more time. You'll see that my information populates. I do have connection and I'm going to go ahead and download. Now, just a quick note, I use stop download reset. You'll see in bold red down here, this type of download cannot be uploaded. Very, very important. If you need to get access to this project and its comments at a later time, you have to make sure you use burn upload project. So you see that the download, download was complete. Visilogical send run command to the OPLC. I'm gonna press okay. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you guys what the data table editor looks like in online mode. So if I go to view, data tables, you'll see that I have a secondary online test button that I have here. If I go into this online test mode, all I'm gonna be able to do is see the logic run. What I care about are the values. So if I go into online, You're gonna see my very first write was at 144 and 23 seconds. Now, if I scroll down, you'll see that it is overwriting the information that is already in the table previously. What I had done was I downloaded this project earlier uh, and I have all of the points logged to the table you'll see that because this is old information now and my row index number is changing, I'm overwriting information in the table. So it's very important to make sure that you account for what your data table write is doing, right? If this information from a previous download was important, um, then I would be losing it right now. But because we don't care about it, this is just an example. Uh, I'm just gonna let this thing do its thing, but you'll see that the timestamp is created and also the triangle wave value. So every one second, what happens is the timestamp gets written and whatever MI1 is at that instance is also written. So I'm gonna go offline here. You'll see that you have a number of options available, right? If I wanted to import or export cells to Excel, I have the ability to do so. If I wanted to import from a created CSV file or export to one, I have the ability to do so. I also have the ability to read and write tables. Um, this is an important one if you have recipes, right? If you're going to go ahead and build um, a new table for a recipe, let's go ahead and do that real quick. If I add a new table, We'll call this recipe. Just for the sake of example, I'm just going to have one column and 20 rows. If I have one integer, if I download this to the controller, I'm actually going to abort that for a second. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change some values here. So let's just say I had a predetermined recipe. If I know that row one had one, row two ha had two, and so on. If I download this to the controller, it's very important to know that all of the logic that is part of the project is going to get downloaded but if you have information in the table you must make sure that you do that uh right via that option that is in the data tables editor and i'll show you what i mean in a second so i'm just going to let this download again if anybody has questions right now feel free to throw it in the questions box i'm going to go into my view data tables and if i go online for my recipe table i have one two three if i wanted to change this value to let's just say five in row seven i can go ahead and write my table to the plc
if I wanted to change this value again to five. I now have five in it as well, where it would have had zero before. So if you wanted to create or edit recipes, you have this tool available to you as well. And then using online is gonna tell you what is in the table at that current moment. So that is the gist of data tables. I'm gonna hit okay. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the trend on screen. So I can use the normal online mode now, and I'll show you what that triangle wave logic is doing just so it makes a little bit more sense. You'll see that my value based on where it's at currently is either gonna be counting down or up, right? So right now, my limit of zero had just been reached, so I'm on my way back up. You'll see that once I hit 100, my upper limit has been reached, so now I am counting back down. So that is what that triangle logic is doing. And again, the reason why it's running in a subroutine is because I'm calling it from the main routine. If I wanted to show you guys the trend on screen, what I can do is I can use remote access that is built into online test. I'll make this a little bit bigger so you guys can see it. It's a little bit too big. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so you'll see that I have my triangle wave value. Uh, on screen, I think that this is just uh, something that is a little bit wacky with remote access when you use online test mode. This is actually in the middle of the trend on screen but this is my triangle wave value you'll see that it's the color that we selected i can toggle a grid on and off right so if i was just curious um how it looked with a grid i can turn this on and off with the button that is labeled g if i wanted to view what some of the previous points were I have the ability to choose this mode button, and this allows me to go from run mode to history mode. So you'll see that this trend has been running for a little bit. I can actually scroll back, and I can see what was happening previous, previously according to the time. So you'll see that as I scroll, the time updates as well. And if I wanted to go back to run mode, I have the ability to do so. Okay, so those are trends and data tables. Um, what I wanna do here now is I wanna jump into an example that is gonna highlight some SD operation. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save this project so I can send it to you guys. We're gonna call this trend and table. And uh, anybody can do this at any point. All of these projects are built into the software, the ones that you're about to see. If you go to the help dropdown and choose examples, if you go into version 900, project examples, navigate down to SD, you do have a V570 SD full demo. And those are all pre-built projects. Now you can, you have the ability to open up those excuse me, you can open those projects up and use them as learning tools. You even can either export routines or just use them as like a skeleton to build your project. So if you know that you have some sort of SD functionality, uh, you could start your project off with this example project. But I just wanna poke through and show you a couple of things. Uh, you saw that we had an SD, I'm sorry, you saw that we created a data table that we were using data table memory for. If I wanted to build a log that I actually wanted to export to or save to an SD card that I could then either send to customers or just pull it off and view it as history or save it uh, in an archive on my PC, for example, I have the ability to use this SD utility, DT for data table to SD. All of these function blocks are gonna come from this SD dropdown menu. So you'll see that you have your data table utilities, trend utilities, Excel utilities. You have an SD safe to remove function block. You also have a clone function block, right? Uh, the SD password, very important to make sure that this is part of a project. 
when you know that you have data that might need to be accessed. You're always going to have the ability via SD card to change the project, right? You can actually create project files that you can upload to the controller from an SD card. If you need to pull anything off, however, that SD password is needed. So um, that's actually a function block that is in the main routine right here. So like, let's just say if I wanted to have it be SD, I could have it be 1111, same as info mode. Uh, the user must enter that password to be able to gain access to anything that is on the SD card to pull off, right? So that is your means of protection. Now you actually, you can, you can disable any sort of uh, means of getting it off in runtime by not including the SD card password. When you go into info mode and there's no SD card password, some of you guys might've seen this before, it's gonna say password missing in red letters at the bottom. That means you do not have access to pull anything off. So if I wanted to take this uh, data table and store it to my SD card in full, you'll see that I can choose the table that I want to log, uh, I'm sorry, the table that I want to copy. This is table log two. Where this comes from is my, in my data tables editor. I have log one, two, three, and four. Just to show you that that's not magic. Those are that like, for example, if we did this, if we use this function block in our last project, it would say test table, and that would be our only option or recipe after we created those two. Now, very important, the options are you can either overwrite or you can append to. So if you wanted to save the full table, you're gonna use the overwrite option, and it's a UDT file by default, the Unitronics data table file. So that is not, openable in Excel until you create an Excel file, right? You can use our utilities to open it, um, but you would need to create a CSV file if you wanted in that Excel format. Now, if I just wanted to add to a table, log three is my table that I'm just appending to all the time. I wanna make sure that this append bubble is selected so I don't overwrite any information. I just wanna to continue to append to it. Now, all these function blocks are gonna have status messages associated. So if you have failures or you start to see some funky issues, um, you wanna make sure that you are monitoring the status at all times. That's actually gonna tell you uh, if there is anything that is going wrong in the project currently or if it's, or if it's happening successfully. And last but not least, creating the actual CSV file. So you'll see that you have two different function blocks. You have the delimited line creator, and then you have the actual write to the SD. So what this SD delimited line allows you to do is create the file how you would like in a format that you want. And again, you see status at the bottom here. And then you have the actual write to the SD card. So where you want to take that information and store it to on the CSV file, uh, uh, on the SD card. Now you can save it as a CSV file or a text file, depending on what you need. Typically you'd want to save it as a CSV file so you can open it again in Excel. Now, um, let's just say in controllers that either don't have an SD card, right, like the Samba, or in applications where you do not want to use an SD card or write things to the SD card, you have external utilities that you can always use at any time that are Unitronics utilities in order to pull information off. One of the more uh, popular utilities is data export. What you can do with data export is set up on a schedule-based uh, polling, or if you wanted to do manual polling, um, what happens is memory that is either in a table or in a vector, you, you actually have the ability to set up whatever you want to pull. You can take that information and data export is a utility that you download and run on your PC. So one of the downfalls is it does always have to be running. Um, but what you can do is you can create a file path on your PC that every time that call is made, it's going to take the information that you decide that you want to pull and it's gonna take it and it's gonna locate it or it's gonna place it in that file path in a new file name. So you don't um, overwrite anything and you have like a running list of, of files from 
all of your calls. Now, the nice thing about data export is, let's just say, if you wanted to have uh, a file pulled every week, like at the end of every week, let's just say Friday night, that's when you want the file to get pulled. If you have an issue on Wednesday, you don't have to wait until Friday for that file to get pulled. You can you can actually trigger like a manual force call to the PLC and pull the information on Wednesday and view from what happened Monday on. Um, you also have UniDDE available too if you wanted to uh, create macros in Excel. Uh, and then you have uh, UniOPC server, right? Would work with like a client package. That's more along the lines of communications. Um, but that can allow you to have compatibility with like a SCADA package or an OPC client. Um, so that's all I have for you guys today for data logging. Um, I appreciate you guys tuning in. I'm going to take some questions now. Okay. So first one, um, if you missed any webinars, uh, make sure that you either shoot us an email uh, or the page that you go in and register. Those are going to have the previous recordings available. Um, if you do not see a demo project that we've done in the webinar itself, shoot us an email, and Zach or I would be happy to to send you the the project that we that we had done in the in the um, in the webinar itself. Uh, will the slides be available to download? The slides are not necessarily going to be available, but if you would like to see them at any point, I'd be happy to send you any of the projects. Um, but again, you're going to have the ability to go into the recording and just watch the beginning and, and you'll see all of the, the, the slideshow presentation material. Okay. Uh, how can I store a float to the table? So you actually, you can store it as a true floating point or you can create a string type, right? Um, in your file creation, if it matters how many characters or how many decimal places are shown, uh, you don't have the ability to necessarily select it, right? So if it does not come through the way that you want it to, if you convert that, uh, number to a string, you can, as you saw when we created our timestamp, you get to determine the number of characters for um, the string size, right? So you have the ability to to just create. You can you can literally uh, convert any number to a string and just write it to the table as a as a string as well. Um, so is it possible to have a dynamic Y scale? Uh, you have to hard code in the um set up for the the curve itself you have to hard code that um if you wanted a dynamic y, y scale um there are some cosmetic tricks that you can do if you will and then you also have the ability to use the eight curves right so like let's just say if you wanted to um scale like scale of value you could just use like a second curve that would have a, a second y scale can i select a different parameter in the same trend yeah so uh, i think that question is um a different memory operand if, if it's not just type in another question um you have again eight curves right so you can have essentially eight parameters per per trend that you can cycle through Uh, is column zero the one second? Um, Okay, I got. I got. I'm just cycling through the questions. A, a lot of them are just where can I find the the, the material.
okay, one, one of the questions is, is how do I trigger physical relays uh, and turn them on and off. You actually do that with ladder, right? So you have you have sets and resets that you can actually tie to a physical output, um, and that's what's going to allow you to to turn those on and off. Now, the nice thing about relays is you have an audible click that you should be able to hear, right? So you should know uh, if it's if it's clicking or not. Uh, I'm sorry, if it's turning on it on or off or not. Uh, how can I write the data table um how can i write an initial value to a string so you have uh function blocks that you have a uh, function block that will allow you to do it you also have the ability to set up like let's just say if you wanted to have um a certain string value on power up you could create like a, a table column and read those out into that string type and that would load it for you as well it's uh, it's it's also important to mention strings can be used at the ladder level where a user doesn't have access to them and you also have the ability to have them on screen where you can uh simply just open up a text box and type with an alpha uh, alphanumeric keyboard uh, I cannot find SD card suite. Can you share a link for it? So SD card suite is going to be available when you go to the website. I'll come up here right now. Uh, if you go to software and go to Visilogic, all of those utilities are going to be down at the bottom here. So when you go to download software utilities, that's where you're going to find data export, uh, SD card suite, OPC server, and uni DDE, and so on. Uh, is uh, I'm not 100% sure what this question is. Uh, column zero, always the x-axis. So on a, on a trend, you're going to have time um the trend that we did time is going to be the x-axis so you it's it's important to make sure that the rtc is correct and that's why that's why i went through the the step of just setting the rtc to, to my pc will the example projects run on any unitronics model great question um depending on the project that you open you want to make sure um, that you take a look at the hardware configuration if you are in the same family and i'm air quoting uh, you can just change the hardware configuration to whatever model you want. You may lose some screens, um, but in a lot of cases, it's just the logic that is important. If you are trying to go from, like, let's just say, like a Vision down to a Samba, um, or, or a model that is not compatible. A lot of times when you do like a hardware configuration change, what happens is it is it erases any changes in the project. The way around that is exactly how we imported the triangle wave subroutine. You can export a routine, right? So anything that's in the example, just make a subroutine for it, export it, and then import it into uh, whatever new project it is and that's basically how you get the the logic and a lot of times you, you might have to rebuild the screens like especially if you're going from like a touch screen to a hard key and vice versa uh, just because those are, are, are not compatible Uh, can you do a session on web server? So we're going to touch on web server or at least the means of accessing a web server uh, next week. Um, so make sure you stay tuned for that. If you have any specific questions on creating like web service for the unit, feel free to shoot that into to the support line. We'd be happy to, to assist you with that. What is the trade-off between... Um, data table and trend data in the sun. Okay, so um, you want to make sure that you are accounting for uh, whatever the, the, the memory that you have available is, right? So uh, if you know that you are going to be saving a lot of data to uh, the table, 
especially with the Samba, in a lot of cases, um, once you bump up against that max size, uh, I, I I don't have a, unfortunately a, a catalog. I want to say it's 120 kilobytes, but I, I can I can get a, an answer for you if you need one. Feel free to shoot that into to support. Um, you want to make sure that you have some means of getting the information off. And, and a lot of times in Samba applications, data export is a great tool because you can literally just pull information right from the table and have it in a PC viewable file. Um, so that's typically uh, how you'd want to go about that with the, with the Samba. Okay, I, I'm seeing a lot of uh questions related to how to get this information if you're having trouble finding it feel free to shoot us an email um in the 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 link here where you have the ability to actually sign up for the webinars if you go up to the top um you're actually going to have the previously recorded webinars uh if you are having trouble getting the project shoot us an email we'd be happy to to send it over to you if zach or i um if it's a uni stream or, or vision zach or i will we'll send you the project that we did Okay, how can we send data table information um, via Ethernet? Um, so it, it's a lot easier to to do that in the in the UniStream series, right? You have a lot of um, industry 4.0 protocols like uh, MQTT, SQL, FTP. Um, you, the, the the best way to do it I would say is uh, I mean you can you can use data export in order to pull it it all depends on um, your controller right if you can save it to an SD card you actually can connect um, to the controller and you can view that information in SD card Explorer SD card Explorer is going to allow you to to see the files that you have on on the SD card currently and you can also read those files and write to the SD card as well Okay, some of the technical literature says that any size SD card can be used. Okay, uh, that so so that's a great point. I actually I, I appreciate you saying that. I wanted to go back and and kind of harp on this a little bit. Um, so depending on the controller model that you have, right? If you have uh, a UniStream, I have seen up to 128 gigs uh, SD card work, right? Uh, um, so I've seen large SD cards work. I have a hard time saying that we support those because I've also seen 128 gig SD cards not work and also 64 um, gigs not work, right? So uh, for the Vision Series specifically, you want to make sure that you are not too small. You want it to be at least four gigs and the max recommended slash supported size is 32 gigs. Um, I have seen cases not so much, again, not so much on the Vision series. I've seen cases in the Unistream series where uh, you can get away with the larger SD card, but it is outside of the range that we can officially say that we support, if that makes any sense. So um, supported range, especially for the Vision series, four to 32 gigs. Um, now, just to, just to touch on the uh, Unistream series uh, uh, again, if you are doing um an update over uh like remote like over ethernet or serially and you're sending those files to a target drive um make sure you're at least four gigs i typically tend to recommend at least eight gigs um or 16 8 and 16 is usually the, the the sweet spot but just make sure that you are within the range on the small side and on the large side just within that range between four and, and 32. Okay, um, 
Yeah. So basic information on on the web server function, we can we can definitely look at that in the in the communication uh, portion of the of the webinar series. So we'll take a look at that next week. Is there any information available on communicating with a cell phone? Yes. Yeah, so uh, again, this is going to be more so along the lines of communication, but you do have SMS functionality available once you have um, the 3G kit. Uh, connected physically over the serial port. So you have the ability to send messages to a phone and you also can reply to a message back to the controller. So let's just say if you have like a uh, temperature, high temperature warning or something like that go off um, and get sent out to the user, you could set up the project so that if the user sends back a certain message, let's just say change temp to 50, you can actually write that 50 to memory in the project. Yeah, so uh, we are definitely gonna take a look at emailing in the communication session for sure. Uh, the most typical examples of data table usage. Um, so that's a, that's a really good question, right? So uh, you can use the table for however you would like in a given project now if you want to create a fifo effect i typically see fifo effect used the most in the in the in the vision series um one thing that zach had uh had detailed in in his uh example pro or in his demo project right you have you have uac or touched on in in the unistream series you have uh uac available in the vision series, any sort of like user access control, like if you wanted to create access levels with passwords and stuff like that, you can use data table tools to do that. So if you wanted to create users and a password, store them to a table, um, add users, delete users and stuff like that, you can use those data table tools in order to do that. That's another, um, not I wouldn't say typical, but rather popular usage for for a table. Uh, and if you wanted to see like an example of that, you can feel free to email us. I, I can I can get I have an example of that that I could that I could send you. Okay. Um, so last one that I see so that I see here. Do do you support 4G and 5G? 3G is obsolete in some areas. Again, we're gonna uh, nail this down next week. Um, we only have a serial 3G kit that we quote unquote support, right? You can use any ethernet, third party ethernet modem, um, just because at that point it is ethernet connectivity and not um, trying to connect via serially. So if you have a third party ethernet modem, you absolutely have the ability to um, to use one of those modems if, if, if they're available. Uh, the one thing right now with the vision series specifically that you would lose is SMS capability. I don't, have a timeline for if that is going to be possible or what, but um, in a in a 3G in a in a Vision Series application where SMS is needed, 3G the 3G modem kit is what would allow you to send and receive text messages. The only thing with that is um, I think there are published dates at this point where you're, you're just not going to have that capability uh, past a certain point. Okay, um, okay. Uh, I see a, a last question about points. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what you mean. If you just want to shoot that one into uh, the inbox, I'd, we'd, be, we'd be happy to take a look at it. Um, all right, guys, I, I appreciate you uh, tuning in. Um, any questions that I either didn't see or didn't get to, um, I, I apologize. Feel free to, to, to shoot us an email. We'd be happy to get you an answer. Other than that, I really, really appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, make sure that you tune in next week on Tuesday and Thursday to go over and review some communications uh, for the Vision Series and for uh, the Unistream series, again, Unistream is always Tuesday, Vision is always Thursday. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I look forward to talking to you guys next week. Have a good one.